May I have the grace to speak in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Several years ago, I was a hospital chaplain for a year as part of my discernment of call to the priesthood. The supervisor of us five resident chaplains met with us each week to talk about our cases and provide instruction in pastoral care. As I began to reflect on my experiences, and especially my concern that I was expected to have divine answers for people's questions and issues, I was relieved to discover that that was not my role. I began to see that God was already in that hospital room. My role, my privilege, was to help the patient and or loved ones discover what that meant for them without imposing my own faith unless asked. I will not claim that I was always successful in my role, but it was liberating to put myself in God's hands, which for me meant Jesus' hands, to accompany folks in their circumstances. In today's gospel, we read the story of two people on their way to Emmaus who discover Jesus as their traveling companion but it takes a while. It's a wonderful story for all of us who are trying to make sense of our lives and the events around us. It really encapsulates for me the life of Christian faith as we practice it together. The story begins on the evening of Easter Day. Two people are walking from Jerusalem toward a village called Emmaus, about seven miles away. They are described as two followers of Jesus, and we learn later that one of them is named Cleopas. Traditional interpretations of the story, reinforced by artistic presentations, lead us to assume that it is two men. But N.T. Wright, biblical scholar and former Bishop of Durham, observes that it is possible that this is a couple, man and woman. He reminds us that in the Gospel of John, one of the women at the foot of the cross is identified as Mary, the wife of Clopas. The truth is, we don't really know, but I find it a helpful way to put myself in the story. When Jesus comes near and begins walking with them, they don't recognize him. They are absorbed in their conversation and obviously despondent. Jesus prompts them by asking what they're discussing. Cleopas responds by talking about recent events surrounding Jesus of Nazareth, recalling his preaching and healing, but who has now been crucified. Their grief and confusion are evident. As Cleopas poignantly says, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. We had hoped. The crucifixion is devastating to all who had hoped that this was the Messiah, the second Moses, who will lead Israel from out of slavery and into freedom. Jesus, the teacher, tries to help them see the story of God's liberation as a story of freedom not from suffering, but through suffering. The resurrection is the promised redemption, the new life on the other side of suffering and death revealed in Jesus' glorification. It's a lot to take in. We don't see any response on the part of the two travelers, but it's significant, I think, that as they approach their destination, they invite the stranger to stay with them and share a meal. Perhaps they wish to learn more. Perhaps they're simply offering the customary hospitality. In the scene at the table, we hear now familiar words. We read that Jesus takes the bread, blesses it, breaks it, and gives it to them and their eyes are opened, and they recognize him as he vanishes from their sight. They marvel at the entire experience, and in the words dear to the heart of any preacher, they say, were not our hearts burning within us as he was talking and opening the scripture to us? And then they respond, despite what must have been a late hour, they get up from the table to return to Jerusalem to share their news with the gathered disciples. Mary and Clopas move from discouragement to excitement. 
They had not recognized Jesus because they did not expect to see him again. They had lost their teacher and with him their understanding of what God was doing. Their new understanding is based on their encounter with a surprising source of hope, the presence of their beloved friend in teaching and breaking bread. In their excitement, they go to find others with whom they can share this news and learn from them about other experiences of the risen Christ. I'm sure it is not lost on you that this story contains an outline for our Sunday worship. The liturgy of the word with reading and preaching from the scriptures and the liturgy of the table where we share in the breaking of bread. And it forms a framework for all our Christian life to discover God at work through Jesus in the words of scripture, in sacraments and worship, and in our everyday activities of eating and traveling. The invitation of the church is to find companions on this journey, to see Jesus at work in liberating us from our fears and sorrows and leading us into the light of his undying love. In our recent Lenten lecture series, we heard powerful testimonies to the role of hospitality in nurturing our spirits. Chefs spoke eloquently about sharing their culture and their passion for good food in creating experiences that welcome guests into a joyful time of community. They spoke about finding ways to support fellow immigrants and those in need of help through the provision of food as both symbol and reality of care. It's a similar message in our weekly lunch program called appropriately Emmaus, where we offer a nourishing meal every Thursday. During the pandemic, lunch became a meal in a bag, offered in a way that continued to feed while minimizing the risk of transmitting disease. Now as we move to reopen our doors for a shared meal, we can more clearly offer the hospitality of community with a hot meal, shared space for dining and conversation, an offering of clothing, toiletries, and medical care. Perhaps you would like to volunteer in this ministry. Some years ago, bracelets with the initials WWJD were very popular, especially among young evangelicals, or perhaps popular with their parents and teachers. WWJD, what would Jesus do, was a way of reminding the wearer to think about Jesus in their everyday lives. It's an important practice based on the sound teaching that we try to model our lives on Jesus. But I have a little different take. Instead of WWJD, I suggest WIJD for what is Jesus doing? What is Jesus doing? I want to move from a theoretical exercise in thinking about Jesus to an existential one of looking for Jesus active now. That is the risen one we worship, the one who comes alongside us, the one we discover as we read and pray and talk and walk and eat. We come together as church in thanksgiving for God's blessings on us. We come together not to witness to our perfection, but to our need for grace. As we discover Jesus' power among us, we learn to share his gifts in ways that overcome the hurts and wrongs of the world around us. We begin with relationships around the altar, and it circles out from there. We try to become a community of love. That's the promise we see in our second reading today. The first letter of Peter was likely written from Rome at the end of the first century. It's directed to Christians in Asia Minor, faith communities composed primarily of Gentiles, especially aliens, slaves, and women married to pagan husbands. These persons were especially vulnerable to persecution. Already at the lowest points in society, they were subjected to further degradation as being out of step with conventional norms 
a threat to Roman law and order. Their willingness to remain faithful members of a loving community in the face of persecution was a joyful witness to the power of Christ's message of nonviolence and peace. As this program year comes to a close, your clergy and other staff are looking back as well as forward. We're asking you to help us evaluate the past year because your experiences and suggestions are important as we make plans for the program year beginning in the fall. Using the model in today's gospel story, we want to offer ways to read and pray with scripture, to break, break bread and sacrament and fellowship, to continue our journeys together by sharing our sorrows and our joys, and to proclaim in word and action the good news of God's care and liberation for all people. We're all on the road to Emmaus, and Jesus is coming alongside. Let's walk and talk together as we discover his loving presence among us. Amen.